from the mid-17th century until today, the Avery clan has flourished in Groton, Connecticut. 1656. Captain James Avery built the house that was to become known as the Hive of the Averys, a house that would be occupied by his descendants continuously until it burned down in 1894. The ten-year-old boy, James Avery, left his home in Ippelpen, Devonshire, in the care of his father, Christopher. The year 1630, they crossed aboard the ship Arabella. Soon the Avery's father and son settled in Gloucester, Massachusetts. The mother stayed home and never made the crossing to the New World. By age 23, James was married to Joan Greenslade. News came that John Winthrop, Jr. had founded Pequot Plantation on lands north of the River Thames. In 1650, the 30-year-old James moved to New London. In 1656, at the age of 36, James built his now famous Hive of the Averys. The first 20 years at the Hive were troubled by the wars of the European settlers with the ancient rulers of the region, the Pequot, Mohican, and Narragansetts. The new settlers took sides with the now pacified Mohicans and Pequot against the warlike Narragansetts. In June of 1657, Uncas, sachem of the Mohicans, that is, the Mohican chief, fled to a fort below Norwich on the Thames River after his tribe was attacked by the Narragansetts. Lieutenant James Avery and others went to his rescue and drove the Narragansetts away. In March 1676, another expedition against the Narragansetts, led by Captain Dennison, Lieutenants Avery and Minor, left Norwich and returned in April with the assistance of the Pequots and Mohicans and a few friendly Narragansetts. On this campaign, Kachon Shea, the Narragansett chief, was captured and brought to a council at Anguilla Plain. He bravely refused to submit to surrender to the English, and when told that he must die, he replied, I like it well that I should die before my heart has grown soft and I have said anything unworthy of myself. Cachanche was executed in the Indian fashion by Oniko and two other Pequot sachems close to his rank among the captors. By August of 1676, King Philip was killed by Massachusetts troops near Mount Hope, Rhode Island, ending the war during which 13 towns had been destroyed, over 600 homes burned, and about 750 English men, women, and children killed. This ended King Philip's war. After this period of Indian wars, the 56-year-old James Avery spent the rest of his days in vigorous activity as pillar of his community. Through long years of service as a military officer, town councilman, and church elder, James commanded the respect of his peers. As well, he had started a large family with eight children. By 1684, Captain James decided to expand his house using timbers purchased from the old Blinman edifice at New London, that is one of the first buildings erected in Pequot as an unadorned church and watchtower of the wilderness. The materials were brought by river and sound and added to the house at the head of Poquanock Cove.
today, Avery Hive Memorial stands on the old home site, as do the original cornerstones, well, and chimney supports. The memorial was built with funds provided by John D. Rockefeller, a descendant of James Avery, through his paternal grandmother, Lucy Avery Rockefeller. At the dedication ceremony of the Avery Memorial, Frank Montgomery Avery delivered the oration as follows. We have assembled here today to join in the dedication of a memorial, not of a monument erected to the memory of a great historical event, or the accomplishment of some illustrious personal achievement, but of a memorial designed to designate the spot where the roots of a family tree struck deeply and strong enough to take permanent hold in the soil of New England, and whence its branches have spread out far and wide, and lusty with the strength of the parent stock. It is to honor the place of our forefathers, refuse and abode, of their struggles and triumphs their birth places and their death place through the early generations, that the shaft has been erected on the site of the first of their homesteads. Groton Town The success of James Avery and his descendants stems in no small part from a happy selection of natural advantages for commerce that bless the deep water harbor at the mouth of the Thames River. The Groton Averys soon turned from farming to shipbuilding, milling, and other commercial activities. Let us see how Groton developed over the years into today's still bustling harbor. The town of Groton lies on Fisher's Island Sound between the Thames and Mystic Rivers. Dutch explorer Adrian Block charted the coast in 1614 when this was Pequot Indian land called Turtle Island. In 1646, John Winthrop Jr. started the European settlement of Groton by founding Pequot Plantation on the mouth of the Thames. By 1705, the population incorporated Groton as a separate town, named in honor of the Winthrop Estate in England. Early settlers lived by farming the rocky soil, soon followed by the shipbuilding and maritime trade, coasting to Boston and New York, and eventually ranging to the West Indies and across the Atlantic. The early period of Groton development is marked by Indian Wars, and we will spend some time examining these because of the light they shed on a, uh, the early history in which James Avery is uh, involved. On Pequot Hill in Mystic, Connecticut, there stands the statue of Major John Mason at the spot where on June 7, 1637, he, with 90 colonists and 100 Mohican Indians, burned to death 600 to 700 men, women, and children of the hostile Pequot Indian tribe. This punitive expedition by Captain John Mason drove the tribe from their position of dominance over the region. The next period deals with Uncas's wars with Sassacus, followed by the King Philip's War. By 1657, Sachem Uncas had separated his tribe from the Pequot Sachem Sassacus. 
Uncas reverted his tribe to the ancestral wolf clan title, that is, the Mohicans. Uncas split with Sassacus over a disagreement about how to deal with the problem of European settlers. For the wolf clan, the area of present-day Norwich was the City of Kings. Sacred grounds nearby were the Couchhagen Prayer Rock and Indian Leap Falls. Today, many of the sacred Indian burial grounds of the Pequot and Mohican have been covered over or violated. For example, the one at Indian Leap Falls has been covered with houses, a mill, a train track, and so on. Lieutenant James Avery and others went to aid Uncas and to rescue him when he was attacked by Narragansetts in 1657. James Avery was privileged to have helped Uncas, one of the greatest leaders of American Native history. And I quote from Russell Means, a Lakota Sioux, uh, about his opinion of Uncas, and he's not alone in having a very high opinion. He says, Uncas was a survivor, a wise survivor. In the latest demographics, it's estimated that in the eastern United States, east of the Mississippi, there were 12 to 14 million Indian people. Where'd they go? Where'd they go? So Uncas represents someone who is smart enough to survive, and he got his people to survive. Otherwise, they'd be as extinct as the hundreds of Indian nations that were wiped out in the Holocaust of the settlement of the East. That was a quotation from Russell Means. On the 12th of August, 1676, the Wampanoag Sachem Metacom, known as King Philip, was killed by Massachusetts troops. This ended a war in which 13 towns had been destroyed and, to a large degree, put an end to the armed resistance to the European settlers in the Massachusetts and Connecticut regions. Now, let's hear the Mohican version of this story uh, concerning this time uh, as told by present-day Sachem Walking Fox. Sachem Walking Fox says the following. I think it's a very impressive statement. in his historical perspective. He says, Prior to the Europeans landing on our shores in those big canoes, uh, and Christopher Columbus did not actually discover Turtle Island, my ancestors, who came over the great Hudson River as Monhiags, to my shame, took everything as they came, and were so brutal that the Native Americans living there at the time called them Pequen, the destroyers. The white man later changed this word to Pequots. Native people called this country Turtle Island long before the arrival of Europeans. After Grand Sachem Wapigwolf who died in 1631, the next sachem of the Pequot tribe could have been either Uncas or Sassacus because of their bloodlines. Most of the tribe wanted the leadership to go to Sassacus, and so it did. After many years, many wars, and the loss of many young braves of the great nation of the Pequots, Chief Uncas tried to get Sachem Sassacus to stop the wars and make peace with the white man. Every time they had gone to war with the white man or neighboring tribes, they had lost many good braves. For every white man lost, 
ten more would show up to take his place. Chief Uncas tried to explain to his people that if they continued on this path of war and destruction, they would soon no longer exist. The trickster, this is a capital T, the trickster, that is Satan, had blinded the eyes of Sachem Sassacus and most of the nation of the Pequots. Again, these are in the words of Sachem Walking Fox. He continues, So Chief Uncas took all who wanted to go and moved them across the Pequot River, which is now called the Thames to the great falls of the city of kings, which is now called Norwich, and named the clan the Mohegans. Now, Sachem Sassacus considered Chief Uncas and his clan to be just another of his many enemies. The Pequots immediately attacked the Mohegans from across the river in the area now known as Fort Shantock Park. Eventually, the white men and the Pequot neighboring tribes grew tired of all the fighting, joined forces, and decimated the Pequot nation. It was at this time that Uncas became the grand sachem of the Mohegans. That brings an end to the quotation from Sachem Walking Fox. In closing about this period of Groton's history, I would say that Avery was privileged to have come into contact with Chief Uncas. We also observe from this period that the Averys probably learned some lessons in courage uh, during battle from the Indians with which uh, they dealt during this time. I think it's not unlikely that the Averys passed on to their future generations tales about the military campaigns with Uncas and Cachonche, those tales may have planted a seed with regard to conduct during combat and personal courage that was to bear fruit during the Revolutionary War. The next period of Groton Revolutionary War period, during the time of the American Revolution, Groton sent out privateers to prey on British shipping. In order to put a stop to this, on September 6, 1781, Benedict Arnold attacked Fort Griswold on Groton Heights with British troops superior in numbers and training. The battle ended in a massacre of the fort's defenders. Groton, by the 19th century, developed into a center for hunting of seals and whales, also major shipyards, built clipper ships and ironclads. After the Civil War, a navy yard was established on the Thames River, which was commissioned a submarine base from World War I. Groton eventually became the submarine capital of the world, as it's called, when the Electric Boat Division of General Dynamics delivered 74 diesel submarines to the Navy in World War II. By 1954, the Electric Boat Division launched the USS Nautilus, the world's first nuclear-powered submarine. Today, in the, this, that is the year the Thames River today still hosts many vessels, ranging from the ever-active island ferries to the Coast Guard Bark Eagle to Polaris-class nuclear submarines. Groton's local economy, bolstered by Pfizer Corporation's pharmaceutical design and manufacture, as well as the electric boat production for the Navy, the Groton submarine base, the University of Connecticut and the United States Coast Guard Academy provides a steady source of employment for many locals. By the time of the American Revolutionary War, the Groton Averys were already in their fourth generation. During this time, New London Harbor on the Thames River was home port for many privately owned armed ships that preyed upon British supply vessels and merchant ships. The privateers were licensed by the state of Connecticut according to the rules established by Congress. Each year they increased in number and captured more British shipping. Their exploits peaked with the taking of the Hannah 
a ship, the Hanna, by the ship Minerva in the summer of 1781. Seizure of the Hanna's rich cargo, which included personal supplies for the British officers stationed in New York City, helped prompt the events that soon followed. Also, some historians believe that this was a the attack on Groton was to provide a diversion against uh, Washington's campaigns in the South. New London's bulging warehouses brought great wealth to adventurous ship owners and merchants, but they were a potential target for enemy reprisal. From the earliest days of the war, state officials had seen the need for harbor fortifications, but construction followed slowly. By 1781, the largest structure on the New London side, Fort Trumbull, was still unfinished and vulnerable to attack from land. In late summer of 1781, the British generals were anxious to distract Washington, who was then marching south. They decided to create a diversion by attacking an important northern supply center, New London, that is, and with the same stroke, destroy the rebel pirate ships. The command of the expedition fell to Benedict Arnold, who had deserted the American cause the year before, and who, being a native of nearby Norwich, knew the harbor area well. Let us investigate what the town of Groton was like on the 5th of September, 1781. A number of inhabitants had returned from the war or were at home on a furlough, and among those killed in Fort Griswold the following morning, fourteen bore the title of captain, as also three who were wounded. So uh, those bearing uh, officers' titles presumably were on furlough to some extent. So that there was a general rejoicing with a sense of peace and safety. The usual everyday tasks had been taken up, and Captain William Latham was building himself a new house. And in fact, he had just recently freed his uh, his slave, uh, whose name is Freeman, uh, who also took part in the battle. In the early evening, when work was put aside, neighbors and friends gathered here and there in little groups, discussing affairs and talking over the latest war news. Lieutenant Park Avery, who had been with Washington, was at home on a furlough, and it is probable he brought the word of the movement south to crush Cornwallis. If so, how eagerly and anxiously the matter was gone over. And then the more homely topics were touched upon, good weather predicted for the morrow, and the usual occurrence of the wind blowing from the north spoken of. So they separated for the night. It was at three the following morning that Sergeant Rufus Avery, who had charge of the garrison at Fort Griswold, saw a fleet of 32 vessels near the entrance of the harbor. He immediately sent word to Captain William Latham, who came at once to the fort. After viewing the fleet, he dispatched a message to Colonel William Ledyard, who quickly responded. I think it's actually Lieutenant Colonel. As the latter stepped into the boat to be rowed across the river, he turned to those about him and said, If I have this day to lose either life or honor, you who know me best know which it will be. Upon this arrival at the fort, upon his arrival at the fort, he ordered two guns to be discharged, that is, the usual alarm. Captain William Latham and Sergeant Rufus Avery fired them at regular intervals, but as the sound of the second one died away, a third one was discharged from the fleet, as Benedict Arnold knew well the signal for help, and that three guns were fired when a prize had been brought into the harbor, or a cause for general rejoicing. Seeing this would prevent the troops from coming to the fort, Colonel Ledger sent swift expresses to call every captain of a militia company to hurry to their aid, 
and a message was also sent to Governor Trumbull. The guns continued to call for assistance, always answered by a third one from the British fleet. At sunrise on September 6, 1781, the people of New London were awakened with the news of a large force of British regulars who had landed on both sides of the river's mouth and were coming upon them fast. They could do nothing but flee. A number of rigged ships in the harbor caught a favorable breeze and escaped upstream, but the rest were trapped. The 800 men, led by Arnold, into New London, met only scattered resistance as they set about the task of destroying the immense stockpile of goods and naval stores kept there. Buildings, wharfs, and ships were soon set in flames. 143 buildings, nearly all the town, were consumed. And of course, you know, we know that Arnold uh, had turned coat, he had turned traitor against the, the cause of the American rebels. And this is certainly, this is one of the, this is his first action in that role. Uh, and we see him using uh, his special knowledge of the local signaling system. Tangled, in fact, uh, Benedict Arnold came from Norwich, so he was actually a local person. He, he, so the locals, even to this day, resent Arnold and remember him always with the sobriquet, the traitor Benedict Arnold. <clears throat> Back to the invasion of New London, tangled woods and swamps slowed the British force of 800 that landed on the east side of the Thames River. A battalion of New Jersey loyalists responsible for moving the artillery could not keep pace with the regulars who came within striking distance of Fort Griswold at 10 a.m. Meanwhile, the fort had been garrisoned with about 150 colonial militia and local men under the command of Lieutenant Colonel William Ledyard. Colonel Ledyard and his officers, expecting reinforcements momentarily, elected to defend the post against the superior force. Colonel Eyer, the British commander, sent forward a flag demanding surrender. Ledyard refused. The demand was made again, and Eyer threatened that if he were forced to storm the fort, no quarter would be given to its defenders. The response was the same. During this time, the British fleet was slowly coming up the river, and it was at 8 o'clock in the morning that the 800 officers and men, with horses, guns, and carriages, were landed at Groton, and an equal number on the opposite side of the river. Captain Shapley of Fort Trumbull, seeing that he was likely to be overpowered by the enemy, fired one volley, spiked his guns, and obeying Colonel Ledger's orders, started with his small, number of, his small company of men to cross the river. A number were badly wounded before reaching Fort Griswold. The army at Groton, having been divided into two companies of 400 each, under the charge of Colonel Eyer and Major Montgomery, appeared in sight about nine o'clock and immediately fired upon the fort. Colonel Eyer led his men to the woods half a mile away whence they ran forward in broken ranks to the shelter of the rocky height about 130 yards from the fort, while Major Montgomery stationed his men a short distance northeast of Eyer. And this is when Colonel Eyer sent his, his flag demanding an unconditional surrender. The British force immediately spread their ranks and advanced on Fort Griswold. As they neared the ditch, they were met with an artillery barrage that killed and wounded many, but the seasoned and disciplined troops continued their charge. Some tried to gain the southwest bastion when they were repulsed, and Colonel Eyre was badly wounded. Under heavy musket fire, another group dislodged some pickets, and by hand-to-hand -hand combat reached a cannon and turned it against the garrison. 
Another party led by Major Montgomery charged with fixed bayonets. They were met with long spears and the Major was killed. A few of the regulars managed to reach the gate and open it, and the enemy force marched in, in formation. Seeing this, Colonel Ledger ordered his men to stop fighting, but some action continued on both sides. Now at this point, the American and British accounts of the subsequent events are at odds. The American version holds that after Ledger gave up his sword in surrender, he was immediately killed with it, and that a massacre ensued. <clears throat> But the massacre, it is claimed, uh, before the massacre, it is claimed that less than 10 Americans had been killed. But when it was over, more than 80 of the garrison lay dead and mutilated, and more than half of the remainder were severely wounded. The British version makes no mention of the massacre or the manner of Ledyard's death. The entire battle lasted only 40 minutes. Now let's examine the British version of this incident. Uh, the British forces included, in addition to regular troops of the 38th, 40th, and 54th Regiments, contingents of Hessian Jaegers, the 3rd New Jersey Volunteers, the Loyal American Regiment, and the American Legion. However, the assault was performed mostly by regular troops, as the Loyal Troops Loyalist troops were engaged uh, with bringing up artillery, which uh, was difficult because of the uh, the need to, to climb to the heights. Now here is a dispatch from General Benedict Arnold to General Henry Clinton, dated September 8, 1781. So we can say that this is Benedict Arnold's official report to his superior officer. <coughs> It goes as follows. From information I received before and after my landing, I had reason to believe Fort Bristol.